So what is yeah. the what is the vision at PSV that you're you're working towards? Yep. I uh, put together two slides, so let me show them to you. Um, so, you know, um, when I started, and actually that's something that I do wherever I, uh, whenever I start a job in a, in a leading position, um, yeah, you, you first want to observe and see, see what's going on. But what I think is really important uh, is that you have a goal and you know where you want to be heading uh, towards within the next three to five years. And also, um, you know, what your short term goals are. So it's, it's really um, uh, all about, okay, everybody needs to know where are we going to head. And, uh, and within the season, you know, it's, it's, it's usually pretty simple, you know, for a team, if they're uh, playing up top, um, yeah, they want to win trophies and stuff like that. But um, it's also about um, the goals that you're setting as a team and the weekly goals you're setting as a team and, and be very straightforward to that. So everyone knows, okay, this is uh, the direction that we as a club are going to, and you are either on board or you can, uh, you can leave. It's, it's really that plain and simple. Um, and that's also something that, of course, uh, in, in the recruiting talks that I have with players, it's about having this vision and um, your style of work and the way you're working and also be very clear about, okay, this is how we work. And we want you to be aware of that. If you are uh, going to be on this team, you, you're going to join us in this culture that we have and um, the DNA that, we, you, that we're trying to build. And um, you're going to be part of that and you're an ambassador. So for us, it's important that you're going to... Um, yeah, follow those things and, and actually believe in those things as well. Uh, so it's not only just about following them, but also uh, believing that what we are saying and that what we want to do is, uh, is something that you want to be, uh, be a part of. So, um, um, yeah, we have that um, written out pretty well and explained pretty well. Um, so it starts with a, basically, if you can look at like a, a quick roadmap and I'll, I'll go quickly because um, um, the other ones probably want to uh, say, say something about their things as well. So um, um, basically my roadmap is that, you know, you have a mission and this is also the mission of, um, of the, the entire club for PSV, so also the men's, uh, men's team, uh, is that we want to create stars together. So, um, and you can put that in many ways, you know, it's not just about on the field, but it's also you know, whenever uh, in Holland, if you win 10 championships, you get another star. Um, so it's, it's really about many things and it's about sponsorship and uh, having a good community. And so it really leads up to this basic sentence uh, that you want to create stars together. Um, so the goals that we were setting, uh, that we've been setting is that we want to win trophies every year. Um, we want to uh, be a contender for uh, permanently for the, the, the last 16 teams uh, within the Champions League. And of course, you know, we know that this is demanding with the, with the budgets that we have, with the league that we have, but we do think it's, um, uh, it's a good aim to look at. And um, there are many teams right now that are evolving that are having a lot of budgets, you know, Italy is coming, um, even Portugal is coming. And uh, so there's, it's, it's challenging, but I do think uh, if we look at ourselves and uh, this is what we want to achieve and uh, yeah, we have a fair chance of, uh, of achieving this and uh, yeah, we need to work towards this. And uh, so this is very clear for everyone. Okay, if you want to do this, that means um, we have to set the, the, the standards high and we need to have a good staff and, uh, good set of players and uh, good conditions so they can uh, perform. Um, so what we're also saying is that we want to deliver players to full national teams and build our academy. It's uh, obviously very important. Um, this is only our second season that we have an academy. When I, it was one of my uh, assignments uh, actually to, uh, to try and build uh, an academy. So we have a second team right now and uh, we're, we're very happy to have that one uh, for the second year. Um, and off the field, it's, um, yeah, it's about setting targets for sponsorship and media department. Um, as Stephanie was also saying, is that, um, yes, we have our own women's department, but with many things we can, um, uh, yeah, we, we share personnel with, um, with the men's team. And then you're talking about media and sponsorship and marketing and communication and all those things. And um, 
which is very nice, you know, and then I think a couple of years ago, they were maybe a bit reluctant about, okay, what's the value of women's football? And uh, yeah, now that we've been, been doing well and uh, competing for championship and, and qualified for Champions League, it, it makes our work uh, a lot easier for them to be willing to, uh, to help set our goals. And uh, so now they, they actually see, okay, we can, we can make money off this, uh, uh, of the women too, so they're really involved, and um, yeah, so, so it, it really helps us in uh, achieving the goals that, that we have. Uh, in this um, what's also important for us is that uh, it's not just about PSV, but it's also about our, our league, our, our highest division, which is called Eredivisie, um, that we have to work together towards um, yeah, be building a good league, uh, and we do this together with the federation, the KMVB, and I think this was also a crucial step that we've uh, taken, um, uh, I think it's two years ago now, saying, okay, you know, it's, it's, if we have a goal, then we should, um, we want to be in five or seven years, we want to be one of the best leagues in Europe. So with this goal being put out, every decision that we're going to make has to be leaned towards that goal. Um, and that has meant, you know, that we have to have more exposure. We need to have uh, the players stay longer in the league. We need to have players returning to the league, for example, that, that we're doing right now with, with Sai van Veenendaal and uh, Mandy van den Berg, and also, of course, with Kaya Simon and the Australian national team players. It's, yeah, you want to have these stars playing in, the, in our first league. And now we're talking also with, um, with people to have our games uh, being broadcast live uh, or the highlights on open net and stuff like that. And yeah, really build this one as well, but also for the, for the teams who, who might not be as good as, as the top teams right now, also make a set of rules in saying, okay, if you want to be a team on the highest league, this is what you need to have for sure, you know? And you're talking about sponsorship, but you're also talking about your staff, you know? How qualified is your staff for the first team, but also for the academy teams? Um, how about the doctors? Um, how many times you practice and stuff like that? Really, these, these set of rules that you make together. So you want to have, if, if teams are entering, you want to have them uh, meet these demands that we are setting as a, as a league. Uh, and that's something that we are um, all involved in. And it's not just something for the federation, but it's for everyone to... Uh, in the clubs to, to talk about this within the board. Um, my next slide is not happening. What what it's what it's basically about is is you know having having a good staff. Um, you know my responsibilities are you know, basically uh, everything from uh, from the sportive part. You know to uh, recruiting the players to uh, build the staff uh, also to um, Make sure that we, um, we we're integrated within the men's uh, departments, uh, and also um, yeah, to make sure that at one point we hopefully gonna be uh, break even with the with the cost side of it. That's that's very short um, the vision that that we have. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Sandra. Um, I'll get uh, Anna to come in and share. Uh, vision next and then when we've had all three we can sort of delve a little bit deeper into each each and one of your work and uh, yeah the challenges and approaches that you're taking towards achieving those visions so yeah Anna I shall allow you to uh, take over the screen Sorry, can you see my screen now? Uh, not at the moment. If you go towards the, the bottom of the screen, there's a, a green share screen button. <clears throat> okay, now we have you. How's that? You can yeah. see that? Perfect. Uh, yeah, it's just shortly about our women's team, we play in Elitetta, which is the second tier. Uh, the goal is to play in the Oskama Svenska next year. If not next year, then hopefully 2022. Right now we're leading the league uh, with nine wins, uh, nine games are played. We have 50% uh, of our 
players are from our own academy. We have uh, one of the best or the best academy uh, in Sweden at the moment, and we're really proud of it. it really gives us a great uh, opportunity to lift players from from our academy to our senior team, and, and uh, but that's still a big part of our vision is to develop our academy to be even better to educate our, our leaders our, our, our coaches to become uh, better in what they're doing and in that way um, like right get the better standard of our players when they're entering the senior senior play senior games we're actually celebrating 50 years uh, uh, as a woman, women's team in icor um, or AIK as a club was started in 1891. So that's when the men started to play in, in this club. And in 1970, uh, the women's team was introduced. So we have a 50 year history, which is um, both good and uh, you know not so good. I think we should be um, further on our development path than where we are at the moment. So it's it's not always, you know, it's been um, a journey that's taken us to the highest division and back to the, to the lower division and then, you know, up and down. So that's not really what I am interested in doing with this team. I want it to be a team that's established in the highest, highest league in Damon Svenskan and becoming one of the best teams there. Um, in AIK, the culture that we are trying to build or that we already have pretty much um, built during these years is that we want to be a positive actor in our community, taking care of the, the people and caring about the people that we work with, that we have contact with on a daily basis and also in our community. Uh, we are trying to be a valued value-based or centered organization. So every decision, everything we do are based on our values. So that's really the guiding, guiding line here. Uh, we also educate all of our youth players and their parents in our like ICO style or what values we want to stand for. So every player, every parent gets that education uh, every year. Uh, we want to build a uh, culture that's inclusive and where people can feel secure, where they can be who they are, uh, and in that way promote like a better performance. So if you're secure, if you're happy, you can be who you are. It's really so much easier to perform on the field as well. Uh, my vision about the women's game or the women's team is that we need to grow in every aspect. Uh, we need to be better. We need, need to be a better project, but in able to do that, we need we need a bigger budget. And uh, how do we do that? We need more sponsors that are interested in uh, sponsoring us. We need to be exposed. So the team needs to be exposed. We need to be have players that people recognize, so that that's attractive for them. They know players and they want to come and see them. Um, right now, it's it's um, Interesting times. We have both Damon Svenskan and Eli Deppan, which are uh, exposed in big media companies. So Express and TV is sending all of our all of our games in our league, and also uh, Aftonbladet, which is which is one of the biggest like newspapers. They are uh, broadcasting all of the games in, in Damon Svenskan. So that really gives a good platform for us to you know show our product but also be interesting uh, for sponsors because they get exposed more. So that's really, really a key. But also, you know, not forgetting that we are a big, important actor in the community. And I think we need to, my vision is that we can be more, like, more involved. Um, we are placed in Solna, which is kind of a north side of Stockholm. Uh, it's very, um, you know, people are coming from, have different backgrounds and we have low income areas, we have high income areas, but really trying to make an impact in our own community. Uh, that's kind of a vision I have. 
right now I'm working on a long-term strategy for the years 2021 to 2025, a four-year strategy where, where we really have, yeah, the same goal as, as, as our men's team. If we're talking about one AIK, which is something that we talk about on a weekly basis in our, in our board meetings and, and, and so on. So that's really what we are, that the goal is to have one AI key. Oh, okay, what, is, what does that mean? It can mean a lot of things, but also that we have both the men's and the women's team striving toward being one of the best in Sweden and top 100 in Europe. That's, that's like group stage in Champions League. So um, that's really the vision or the goal uh, in, in the sporting side. And then really making sure that we as a club understand the commercial potential in the women's game because it is becoming big business right now. And uh, there is a reason why Chelsea, Lyon and uh, other big clubs, traditional men's clubs are investing on the women's side. And it's something that we really haven't like figured out in Sweden yet, I think. Our biggest clubs are Rosengård, FC Rosengård and uh, Kopparberg Göteborg, which are the leading two teams, but they're female clubs. Um, but I think as, as a, you know, both men and, or a male and female club putting those together, I think we have a potential in our trademark and kind of getting a, getting a good support from, from below, uh, from our supporters and, and sponsors. But really like trying to wake up the common understanding for the commercial potential of the, of the women's game. Uh, and understanding like the trends in sponsor landscape, which um, things are changing. I think it's the time of change is now. If we look at globally what's happening with different kinds of movements like Me Too, like Black Lives Matter, equal pay, all of those things. Uh, you cannot miss those, you know, it's really, we're living really interesting times um, as far as change goes. And uh, I think that you can also see in the sponsoring side of things, you know, there are big sponsors who want to see that the clubs are working equally for both men and women, for the boys and the girls. And that's really something that we need to use, I think. Um, and then, the, then this, I think, goes back to what I said earlier, like serving the community and uh, giving back and creating meaningful projects, um, like, yeah, arranging football camps for just girls. I mean, not, I have a seven-year-old son myself, but I think generally the boys have so many more opportunities than the girls have. So I think we really need to put focus on what can we, what can we like give to the girls, how can we empower girls to become more um, integrated in the society? Um, yeah, becoming leaders of, of themselves and, and, and having more like idols or what's the right word of our players and, and so on and so forth. And um, another thing I would like to put more focus on is the mental health uh, issue that we see so many women young women and girls to, to suffer from. So something that I really have in mind to, to focus on, if we can give back something. I don't know if I have, yeah, that's about it, really. Okay, fantastic. Right, we should certainly be delving into lots of that in a moment. I think first then to uh, be able to uh, unshare the screen. Yes, sorry. There. No, how do I stop share? There. Yeah. Yes. There we go. Back on uh, full screen and sort of a uh, hand over to Stephanie and see, uh, yeah, it's the vision at um, the Utah Royals. All right. So these are our goals in just a quick snapshot form. Um, um, I think 
everyone probably has some sort of on-field success piece of their goals. I mean, that's what we're all doing. We're all trying to win here. So uh, for the Royals, um, we are in um, 2020 would have been, um, if it were a normal season, would have been our third season as a team. Um, the team's created in 2018. Um, and the past two seasons, we've been two points and then four points um, outside of playoffs. So we're just on that cusp um, and needing to make those um, changes that get us over the cusp. Um, one of the um, things that we had to go through this off season as well was a coach change. Um, Laura Harvey took a position with U.S. Soccer um, in their U-20 team. So we um, have hired, we hired Craig Harrington um, as our new Royals coach. He's been in the NWSL um, the past few seasons as an assistant coach. So um, we're also um, kind of working through everything that comes with a coach change um, to a new style of play um, new personnel, um, needing to find new players that fit his system better. Um, and then also just the, the, the pieces that go along with managing a staff in, um, a, an assistant coach that's now wearing the head coach hat for the first time, um, and what that looks like in, in his development as a coach. So lots of things, um, going on this year for us. Um, but it still doesn't change that we see ourselves as a uh, championship caliber program. Um, and we just need to put the pieces together to, um, to get there. So, and that's our, our first goal. Um, the second goal, um, maintain health was actually, um, a goal that our staff, um, asked to add. Um, and I really like it because to me, it encompasses everyone being able to do their job well. So, um, obviously injuries happen in sports. We know that they do. Um, but to minimize that means sports performance is on point and our athletic trainer is on point and the coaching staff are working closely with them and listening to them and players themselves are taking care of their bodies and doing what they need to to recover um, and be ready to go. So I, I, I really like that one because it just involves everyone being on top of their game. Um, so I appreciate that our staff thought to bring that one forward. Um, number three kind of comes with that um, coach change um, in creating a team with a, a winning mentality. I think um, the roster that we have, um, we, we took over a team that um, was uh, the ownership group was selling. So we took over a team um, and a squad that was kind of finishing middle to bottom of the table and didn't have an ownership group that had the resources that we have and didn't have a facility that has the resources we have. So they were a little bit um, in a place where they existed and where they were fine existing. And we're trying to change that. We're like, Goal number one, we want to be um, a championship caliber team. And so that involves changing the mentality of the players of you can do this, you will do this, and this is how we're going to do it. So that's a big piece of it as well. The last three um, um, goals are more from um, my perspective and where I sit with um, the business side and our um, development side and kind of longer term um, plans um, for the organization and not just the soccer side. Um, RSL, the, the men's program, is one of the top three MLS clubs that have home, homegrown players, the most home, have signed the most homegrown players. So um, their strategy is absolutely one of development. Um, they are not spending a lot of money on big name players. They are developing them and signing them at 17, 18, 19, and pushing them through the system. Um, and that's where Royals want to be as well. Well, um, and that involves a lot of planning and programming at the youth level mm -hmm. from 7 to 12, um, and then a, a formal academies from 12 to 19, um, and working with the players on what is your path, where are you going to go, are you going to play at college, are you going to go um, 
with some other opportunities or whatever it might be. So we are in the process of building that program. We've, hi we've started to hire staff this year um, to build that program out. Um, and part of our goal in that is to align with the men to be have Utah be an epicenter of youth training for the United States, um, for our clubs to be the place where kids can see in real life tangible examples of becoming professionals through the system. So that's a, a long-term goal for us with the, um, the smaller steps um, at, at the ground level for 2020 and 2021. Mentioned earlier that our average kind of fan draws between nine and 12,000. We want 12,000 at every game. Um, so that's, that's an overarching club goal that comes, um, that sits mostly on the ticketing and the, and the business side. Um, but whatever um, we can do to support that, um, whether it's um, player appearances or um, reach player reaching out player player reach outs to season ticket holders whatever it might be um, that's an overall goal of the club that um, the soccer side has to support um, and and so far our players have been more than willing to get on board with any of our um, business side goals um, and the final one is kind of all encompassing of inclusivity and equality I think um, from an equality perspective um, there's so many different ways um, that, that that could go for our club um, with the creation of the Royals in 2018. The two biggest pieces of that that have been added to the RSL um, side has been pride games and um, women's equality, obviously. So um, we have um, a, a, our owner is very, very um, set and uh, that the whatever the men have, the women will have. So we have um, our own locker rooms, our own facilities, um, all of the same caliber and level of the men. Um, and from a community aspect, um, MLS or the RSL team on the MLS side had not had a pride game until we arrived. So that was something we're incredibly proud of as well in bringing that message to Utah. Um, and inclusivity is something I think that we're, um, I think Black Lives Matter has already been mentioned, but it's something that we're learning more and more about daily. Um, and it's something that I think we strive for with our players, our fans, our staff, um, and is something that is an ever evolving conversation. So I don't think that there's ever one right plan for that, um, but I think it does involve some sort of plan or action, um, which is for us ever evolving. <laughs> so those would be our big three or our big six goals. Um, some of them soccer side related, some of them business side related, but big, big work to do and during a pandemic. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think there's, um... Yeah, across the three visions there, there's a lot that um, cross over. There's a lot of crossover there with things that you're, you're all looking at. Um, certainly interesting to allow you all to sort of question each other on your approaches around some of those in terms of the youth development and um, certainly how you're integrating with the men's side of your clubs. Um, and the inclusivity, which you just mentioned there as well. Um, obviously with that fan engagement and the growth of your own clubs and, and leagues. Um, but I don't know whether I we'll just start the ball rolling with a with a question from uh, one of our attendees today, Laura L Laurie McGinley. Um, Laurie asks, uh, as a head coach of a first team women's club, he works a lot on the technical aspects due to his background. What do you look for when it comes to recruitment of coaches? Which I know is something that you've done recently, Stephanie. So maybe uh, you'll be uh, the best person to start with on that. Um, is it qualifications over personality? And I guess for him would be interesting to see if there's a difference between yeah, how you're recruiting in the, in the different cultures that you work in. Yeah, I think uh, the, I do think qualifications um, are an initial um, piece of the conversation, but for us, especially in this um, most recent coach hire, the bigger um, piece that we were looking for was fitting into that vision and fitting into that um, development mindset. So I think it's, it, it, 
not all first team coaches want to worry what the 12 year olds are doing. Um, and I think that that's, that's an important piece for us if we're going to develop um, or become a team that develops players. So um, fitting into the vision in the system was, was the se second piece that we looked at. Um, there were other smaller pieces that um, I, I was aware of or kind of highlighting um, having been in this league for um, seven to eight years, there's certain aspects that I think um, help a coach be successful in this league. So there was um, certainly um, things that I looked for um, that tied to that. And then um, personality, I think, is also a piece to it. I think um, being able to work with the owner and work with the other staff that run the club. Um, I do think culture is, is a big piece. So those are probably the three main areas that we looked at when we were um, recently hiring. Okay. Um, so Anna, I don't know if you could uh, pick up that thread. I'm not sure whether you've had to hire a coach as yet. Not yet, but I know that will be the case this winter or before the season Oh, or after the season has ended because one of our we have two head coaches at the moment we have one female and one one male head coach and our female coach got offered a u15 u17 uh, national team head coaching position so she's unfortunately leaving us uh, so this will be something that um, will be on my on my desk um, this fall. Uh, so just like Steph, Good luck. we're also looking at, of course, the personality you have to fit in, uh, in the, like the culture of, of the club and culture of the team and understand where we want to take, take the team. And I think big, big thing for me is for this person to understand where we are going, what, you know, if we want to be one of the best teams in Sweden, what does that mean? So you really have to have understanding of the, the game at, at its highest level, I think, uh, if you want to be one of the, one of the best. Um, but also, like Stephanie said, you know, you have to be somebody who takes responsibility and wants to be part of developing uh, the youth and uh, youth coaches and give back and, you know, give from your experience to, to make the academy better so we can get better players in return. Um, yeah, I guess those are the main things for me, uh, what I am going to look at. Yeah, and Sandra, see if you uh, have one sort of anything to add on the hiring side and then maybe sort of some, to move it on once that coach is in place, you know, the, you may have, that person, the coach may have interviewed well, but to make sure that they're still remaining in line with the vision when you're working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so um, I want to add on the, the comments that have already been made. What I think is very important is that um, they can execute the style of play that we are looking at. Uh, for PSV, the DNA is uh, attractive uh, football. So you have to know how to play attractive. Um, that was uh, one of the important things, of course. Um, something else that's been more important is that um, knowing how to manage uh, your staff. The staff is, uh, you know, increasing in numbers. Um, sometimes they have a staff uh, of 15 to 17 people. So uh, you have to know how to manage everything. Um, uh, so you're, you're not just a tactical uh, coach anymore. You're also a manager and uh, that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, so you need to be able to, to structure your work, um, to know how to make sure that everyone is, uh, knows their responsibilities and knows when to execute them. Um, and also um, yeah, being able to communicate very well, and not just with the staff, but also with the players. Um, I think um, uh, yeah, one of the differences in, uh, in coaching men versus women is I think uh, women uh, prefer more more contact, you know, to to know from the coach how they're doing, um, yeah, be be more in touch with the coach and uh, having um, individual discussions and stuff like that. So um, I think that's that's something a coach needs to uh, to to have a sense of when to do this and and when when not to do this. 
Um, yeah, and also, of course, once the coach uh, is established, how do you make sure that he's uh, achieving the goals? Um, it depends on how you're working. Um, I, I tend to um, be a manager that's uh, working closely still with the, um, with the staff. I'm very involved. Um, um, of, of course, you know, also have to do the recruiting, but I'm very involved in, uh, in the style of play, in how they execute, uh, involved in the tactical meetings and stuff like that. I even sometimes have individual talks with, with the players, uh, how they're doing as well. Um, and I'm, I'm very much uh, in touch with our head coach. Um, yeah, we basically um, have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, the whole time uh, talking about how not just group dynamics and it's, it's really everything that, that we talk. So I'm, I'm very involved actually to, uh, to make sure that everything is uh, going the way that the head coach and I want to go. So what's, what's crucial is that we get along well and, uh, uh, in order to, to make sure that we achieve the goals that we've set for PSV. Yeah, it's kind of a really important aspect of your role in, in building those relationships and kind of, I guess there's lines there, which obviously there's, you know, if you're interacting with players that you don't overstep into the, into the coach's realm too much. Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, when I'm uh, on the field watching the practice, uh, I don't, you know, I don't make any comments very rarely when I do see a situation, but it's also something that, um, you know, I'm always discussing with the head coach saying, okay, you know, if, if, uh, I know when he needs to take the leadership and stuff like that, and he will do so. So he feels comfortable with me sometimes saying something to an individual as well. So it's really that you need to make sure, and we did this when we you know, first started working together, you need to make sure that you have the same idea about football and have the same goals and how to reach them. So for, for me to make a comment towards a player, I know that he approves of because uh, he thinks the same way and it's, it's the same goes with him, you know, you can you know, do whatever you want uh, with the players in, in the style of coaching and uh, um, I approve it as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very important that you, you get along in, in, uh, in terms of the vision and how you want to play and stuff like that. So um, we don't have any issues in regard to that. And when it comes to games, you know, it's, uh, I don't, uh, um, I don't get involved during the game. It's only afterwards that we discuss it. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we'll go over to, to Stephanie. Obviously, you sort of had that transition and then sort of, yeah, you sort of had a long relationship with, with Laura, um, a close working relationship. So you, you know, had a real close bond and you sort of knew how to work around each other and, and then sort of having now to, to adjust to, to someone possibly working in very different ways. I mean, I'll ask one, yeah, to, to go on that. And then there's also a follow-up question from Laurie, which um, he's asking, does working abroad help? So I guess it's part of, if abroad helps, I guess if that's away from your league, or you want really someone who has experience within your own league as well? To answer that question specifically, I, I don't, for me, um, it, it doesn't help, but it doesn't also hinder. Like it just, um, if you have the qualifications, um, the experience and are part of the vision, then um, you're, you're worth part, you're part of the discussion. So um, it, it's not necessarily um, a, a benefit or, or a hindrance. Um, in working with a new coach, um, it has, it, it's been um, an adjustment and a change, um, but it's not been anything harder or um, ch more challenging than um, and than any other part of uh, being a general manager. I think um, in some ways, Laura and I had worked together so long that um, we were we were not challenging each other anymore. Um, and so this new coach has become a new challenge for me um, in, in my development as well as um, helping him in his. So um, it, it's, it's, it's reminded me that um, in sports, or I guess essentially in any career, that there's always room for growth and development. So um, as much as I miss the banter between Laura, um, it's been um, a, a great change. Okay, fantastic. I mean, with Anna, with the relationship you're having with 
two head coaches. And I'm going to try and sort of move this on now towards we're looking then at the youth development side. How does that sort of, between the three of you, does that whole sort of creating that pathway from a youth development side all the way up to first team, how's, how's that relationship work? Yeah, well, our head coaches, they're not full time. So both of them have, have other jobs as well. Carolyn, she is working on the, the Stockholm Football Association and like being very much part of the youth de development of the Stockholm youth uh, from all different clubs. Whereas Robert, uh, he's working in our Soala uh, High School, where most of our academy uh, youth players are training and going to school. So we have like a direct uh, contact with them. And also both of them have been in this club for quite some time. So they have developed a good relationship with our academy uh, coaches also. And I work closely with uh, Malin, who is our head of the uh, girls academy. So we have, we like throw ideas at each other and I'm really much interested in how that work is, you know, developing and uh, what direction we need to take it and where do we uh, need to put more focus on. So it's really, but it's a work in progress, of, of course. We need to be more time, we need to have, you know, more contact time with the youth or the academy, especially the U19 team, uh, coaches and, and the team, and maybe training more together, which is, a bit of a goal for next winter when we can look at you know playing more 11 versus 11 uh, in trainings and developing more sides and uh, getting more contact time. Okay, I know um, Laurie's question here on AIK. I think from the men's side, they sort of rely on a pedagogy approach. Um, what is the philosophy? around that and does that also is that something that is now club wide you're doing with the men and women is the at the younger age do you have sessions where you mix the boys and girls together is that a question for me uh yes um, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. But, no we don't we don't have the mixed uh, gender like uh, sandra you guys have in the netherlands um, unfortunately i think i think that's something that we should really look into because uh, from my perspective and that what I've learned from especially Netherlands, the way they educate their youth and all the way to the senior levels, they are very much uh, mixed uh, gender. You know, why do we have, why do we, why do we start with kids that boys are separate from the girls? They have so much to give each other and they can have different qualities. Where boys are probably more like bring the winning mentality they're more into that, that competitiveness whereas girls have the understanding of the social they take more responsibility and for the whole and uh, and also taking into consideration that girls actually mature much faster or earlier than the boys so there's a size difference uh, at certain ages where actually the physical size that's not the issue here and so that's that's something that I like to see in our club uh, to become more of a norm. So it's definitely a discussion I'm going to have continu uh, continuously with our academy uh, chief and, and uh, yeah, uh, development chief also. I bring Sandra in. Obviously, um, Anna sort of mentioned some of the development structures that are there in, in, in Holland, that it's freer for the, the boys and girls to mix together. But in self, you are sort of really only just starting out in sort of developing a, an academy at, at PSV. I mean, what are the challenges you're, you're facing at the moment regards that? Yeah, um, I think it's a huge advantage that um, uh, boys and girls get to play together from an early age on. Um, and I'm very happy uh, the, the KMV, the Dutch Federation, has decided to, uh, to encourage this. Uh, so yeah, this is happening uh, really up until age, well, it can be up until age 18, uh, but what you see, there's more and more women's teams that are actually having, uh, building an academy um, with players that are, are younger, you know, starting as of yes, uh, 12 to, to 13. Um, 
uh, up until 18. Um, our philosophy right now at PSB is that, yes, we have um, um, an academy, but we don't want to have uh, the players to be too young uh, to already come and join us. If they uh, can play at a very good team, uh, that's a boys team, we encourage them to play there. Um, and I think, you know, because, uh, uh, yeah, the level and, and um, the boys being uh, physical and fast and stuff like that and, and having to take care of the ball really quick, um, those are huge advantages that, uh, yeah, I think um, in our growth of women's football, I don't think uh, there are enough girls to uh, create your own um, uh, structure. I think we still need boys and I think it's good. But it doesn't mean, you know, I think uh, like we've also seen in the uh, in, in US um, earlier um, that they are able to have a good uh, structure for women's football as well. Um, I do think the US needs to change now too with, with the uh, development area and, and the college and how things are set up, of course. But uh, that has been an example uh, for the past decades, for sure, at least for me. Um, so I, I do think we always have to look really careful at how is uh, the country um, developed and what is necessary and able um, for, for the girls to have the best player pathway. And yes, for sure, in Holland right now, it's uh, having mixed uh, football and then at a certain age, uh, go to the uh, women's side. Or uh, yeah, probably as of 17, I think, would be the best age to, uh, to have just a, a, a girls team. And uh, Stephanie nodding in, in big agreement when you mentioned some uh, reforms in the in the way uh, the development pathways in the US. So uh, yeah, Stephanie, what are the uh, the big agreements and, and possible little adjustments that you think need to be to be made with uh, within the US system? Yeah, I think um, Sandra mentioned college, and I think that that's the biggest. Um, piece that is probably different for the US um, is there the college game does not lend a lot to development um, it's a three-month season and you have however many two games a week for however those however many months um, and it's just it's just not enough um, and I think it's um, not lending itself to a pathway um, that's going to make the NWL more successful so um, I agree that the, um, the college pathway is um, not one that's going to help the NWSL in the long run. Um, but at the moment, I have a hard time seeing the l mechanics of telling an 18-year-old to forego a four-year ride and a college education from a top standing school to come play in the NWSL for $20,000 a year. So the league also has some growth um, to be able to make that a, um, a worthy transition for the player because we all know sports don't last forever um, or you're, you're not an athlete forever. Um, and so being able to fall back on that education, I think is important um, for the moment, but the league has to grow as well um, to make that um, pathway less desirable. I have a question about that, Stephanie. Have you, um, because the, the NWSL, uh, it's, the league itself is not too long and you're, you're finding that more uh, players from US and even Australia are curious uh, to play in Europe right now. Um, I, I think it, it, one of the reasons could also be the, the length of the league. Have you uh, thought about um, changing this to, to make it a more a year long season or, or 10 months or so, or that's not up for, um, no, I do think so. I, I think that um, it is a discussion amongst the ownership of how of how to um, extend the season and when it's the right time to extend next season. As I mentioned previously, ticket sales are a huge revenue piece um, for owners in their individual markets. Um, and if you extend the season into you know, right now, preseason starts March, um, and usually the um, championship is sometime at the 
the end of September, early October time range. If you extend either of those start or end times one month, um, you're now playing in cold months, um, which is hard to sell a ticket to. So that's been the major um, drawback to extending the season. Um, but as the our philosophy in Utah is that as the season or as the league expands and we get more teams, um, that's going to make it a more natural progression to grow the season a little bit longer. Um, so I, I personally, I would love to season, see the season a bit longer from that perspective, um, uh, both of the reasons that you mentioned, but the, the, the logical and the numbers side of it um, needs to kind of be a growth that makes sense. Um, because if we just made it a little bit longer um, and had started having games in March or in November, for us, it would be just a, a, a straight loss of um, cost, but a little benefit because here it's hard to sell a ticket in March or November for an outdoor sport. And where that that comes in with um, the integration with the with the men's team in, in in Utah, with a lot of things you sort of with the youth development and that argument over over um, the college's um, route and obviously then the expansion of the leagues. How is that a, an advantage for you or can it also work against you? Um, the relationship with the men's team, I definitely think is, um, is an advantage for us uh, and how we want to function. It's almost a little bit of a copy and paste blueprint um, of how the men work and how we can adjust it for the women. Um, but I do think that that's, um, that's, a, that's also just our reality. Like it, it, it would be difficult. I think it would be difficult to be a women's team attached to a men's team and try and have a different philosophy. Um, it's the same ownership group, same um, staff, all functioning under one roof. If you were trying to be separate, that'd be a little bit harder, um, my, my opinion. But I do think um, in the NWSL, if you look at the independent teams that are not attached to MLS, Chicago, Sky Blue, Rain, um, North Carolina, they've also been successful in their own way. So they've figured it out um, on how to how they want to function and how they can work. So I think this league has proven in the U S that it's it either way is possible. Um, and either way can be successful, um, for us, um, uh, and being attached to an MLS and, um, the RSL, it, it, it's been fantastic. Um, and so, and having previously worked at the rain, I, I have experience on both sides, um, as an independent, as an, and as an MLS. So, um, there's pros and cons to both, um, and ways to be successful either. So, um, I, I, I do I do think that's pretty unique about this league um, that they that they're it's structured as such in, in either way. And then Anna, how does that relate to your experiences since joining IK? I think you mentioned earlier that the, the, the bigger teams or the successful teams in women's football are independent teams in Sweden. Yeah, uh, like I said, it's Rosengol and we have a body uh, in Gothenburg at this time so for some some years now um, uh, then I think it might be that the future will be a little bit different depending on how the, the traditional big men's clubs like AIK what decisions are being made uh, now um, it sounds like from Stephanie that you guys are ahead of the game as far as like integrating with the men, the men and the women that you are trying to basically copy paste uh, what the men are doing and uh, as far as the organization and how you have the team and so on. We're not really right there at the moment. It's really uh, the biggest, my biggest job is to get that kind of through in our club and uh, kind of like uh, taking down some old structures and uh, ways of doing and ways of seeing things and really introducing the possibility of, like I said, about the commercial side, that we can actually make money from, from our 
women's team uh, just look around what's happening with the, with the in the world with the women's game right? and, um, but like i said we're not really there at the moment but it's it's uh, it's the biggest issue that i'm really working on uh, towards our board and those who make the decisions um, and i think my feeling is that um, we're, in three weeks time we'll be having to two-day conference where we go through strategy and and really try to push through uh, the strategy that I a little bit of it I showed to you uh, this four year like strategy and, and goal setting what we need in budget wise and because it, at the end of the game it's really about money and how to get things and done <clears throat> but we also we get benefit of, of using the personnel in our in our office and marketing side and all that. But the focus is still so much on the men's men's side. And really, we need to look at how we uh, integrate our women's team fully to the structure of the whole club. Um, Sandra, I believe you're sort of, sort of having a fair level amount of success in terms of integrating the, the women's side with the men's side, and you're sort of now together in the same building using similar facilities on the on the playing side yeah i mean it, it's i can really relate to anna's uh, situation right now because there was the situation i was in uh, three years ago um and and it's it's really it was my main focus was to get integrated within uh, the department and of course you know you need uh, success uh, which you are having so that's that's i think very important uh, you're doing well with the team um, uh, and you're up top so uh, you know once you go to the to the highest league it's it's important that you uh, do well again um, and then you know it's, it's going to be easier to um, uh, to to become integrated and yeah one of my things that i also think is very important is that um, show that you are responsible show that you know you have a good staff that you have good players and that your goals are very clear and um, um, and so everyone is also aware of that this is a very interesting um, part of sports that's money where's money uh, can be earned so uh, i think once uh, people are becoming more aware of this um, i think it will happen so when we talk in three years i, I think uh, uh, there's a very good chance you'll be at the same position that I am right now. I hope so. I, that gives me much hope, at least, to know that you've been in the same position. So, but it requires a lot of work still. Yeah, and also, um, you know, and that's what I keep telling my staff too. You think you are integrated right now, but it's a very thin line that you walk on the whole time. Because, you know, especially with COVID times right now, there are budget cuts and, um, uh, you know, we also uh, had some reduction in our budget, but we all had. So I'm very happy that they didn't say, okay, we're going to uh, cut the whole women's side. And I was, you know, uh, confident enough that they weren't going to, but it is still a very thin line. And uh, you need to always be aware of that you have to step your game up way more than other departments uh, or other uh, uh, boys teams or what have you uh, simply because you're a women's side and that's um, our status and that's going to be our status for quite some time and i think that's part of the deal uh, it also in a way um, helps you to stay focused and to keep on working very hard and uh, uh, to make sure that you're on top of your game I'm aware of this yeah, and you know, one interesting thing I think is that uh, the supporters that really are the driving force of our clubs, because it's really the supporters who are um, showing what they want and they need to step up and show even more. But I think the supporter, supporters are, you know, the fan culture is changing. There's a new generation of people who want uh, also the women's side to get the equal amount of attention, equal amount of um, money and, and so on, resources. Uh, so that's really the driving force. And I'm, I'm really seeing that in AIK, which gives me, you know, the feel that I need to drive this process through. I but I can also comment on, and it's been uh, at least on my journey 
from uh, when I was a player uh, and playing the, in the women's national team in Finland. You know, we before we succeeded in uh, taking the team to the European Championships in 2005, we were nothing. We were, you know, you know nobody knew that we were even playing a game because you couldn't read about it, you couldn't see the games. Uh, we were not existing. And then that day in Moscow, 19, no, 2004, when we won that last uh, game, it's like everything kind of changed, but it's been a slow process. And uh, it's a privilege to have been, you know, part of the journey from almost the beginning uh, to have the perspective that where the game is now, you know, with 2019 World Cup and all that success, it's a long journey uh, before that. It's um, it's so many names who have or players who have done exceptional jobs like Michel Akers, Mia Hamm, you know, Abby, Wombach, uh, you name it. It's they're everywhere, but it's those pioneers that really have made this possible. And uh, really, to have that perspective is you can appreciate now what you have and what you can do. You know, from now on to 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 have um, and see this uh, game, beautiful game to grow on the women's side as well. And, you know, going from having one training t-shirt you know, during the whole week, camp uh, week, and uh, really bad flights, you know, traveling through Europe with four or five flights just to get to a game in, in uh, England or Portugal, you know, one, one day ahead. It's like these, these small things that make such a huge difference. Um, and seeing where we are now, it's like, it's really interesting. I, I think it's, I'm really happy where we are not right now, but I think there's so much potential still for us. And where you then move from where the game is now, and obviously you, is it an integrated club? Is it possible that it becomes one community club and that the fans of the men and the women's team are the same people? Or is it that the men's and women's football game will be slightly different and you are appealing to a different set of people in terms of those who come to watch you play football? I think the fan base is different. It might be that way um, forever, I don't know. Uh, but um, I think that's changing a little bit. I, we're discussing ideas like having the home games on, on the same day so that we play first before the, before the men play and we get more supporters. They, they pay for a ticket for both of the games and come and uh, get an experience with the women's team and really like pushing through that the women's team is, is a good product. It's fun to watch. We play technical football uh, and really knowing the players profiling the players so that the fans can like identify with them. But as far as the fan base, you know, in the, in the men's side, there's always going to be like these ultras and, and uh, these um, hardcore black army like we've had or had in AIK. Um, I don't know if, yeah, we're more family uh, oriented. And, um, so kind of like finding uh, synchronicities there at least. Uh, how we can, how the supporters can, if they want to support both the women's and men's and be, being part of that journey. How are you, how are you finding, Sandra, how are you finding that at, at PSV? Obviously a strong fan base for the men's team. Is there yeah, finding those synergies between the two or is it a case of, well, actually, no, we are a, we are a separate product when it comes to match day. We're a separate product. I think it's, um, and of course, you know, there are more uh, fans, more and more fans from the men's side that are also interested in the women's side. But I do like to see ourselves as something else. You know, it's, it's very unique. And um, um, also um, our players are very approachable, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, the, the status, the star status that some of the men, um, give themselves or uh, receive. Uh, it's, it's different in the women's side. Um, they are very approachable. Um, I do think, you know, it's more family. It's a family event, um, much more so than um, 
for the men's side for the men's games. So I do think uh, it's it's different. There are some similarities, uh, but I do see us as a, a unique product. And and some you know it could be for example that one of the um, uh, spectators who is who is a guy uh, that has a wife and and two kids that is also coming to the game. Um, uh, yeah, something the the that that could be some similarities, but other than that, I do think it's different. Um, for you, Stephanie, at Utah, I mean, you have this aim of growing up to having a have a core fan base of twelve thousand. Um, in terms of driving that, what has what have been the most successful approaches for you in terms of fan engagement? I think for us, the um, to Sandra's point, like the players are so much more accessible. Um, that's the a huge a huge draw. Um, I think that the success of the national team at the World Cup is also a huge draw for us. Um, it's, it's a chance to see those stars in your backyard. So um, not just the Royals, but whoever we're playing against as well. You know, Alex Morgan, always a big draw. Um, and Lindsey Horan at Portland, always big draws. Carly Lloyd, Sky Blue, always big draws. So, um, and those players, like, th they spend – 20, 25 minutes, sometimes half an hour post game, just circling the ground, signing autographs, taking pictures. Um, so it, it, they're super accessible and they're still devoted to the fan base. And they know that there's still work to be done as a collective for women's football. Um, and, the, and to Anna's point, they know that the, everything that Abby, the Abbeys and the Mias have done before them, and they feel like they still need to pay it forward. So um, they still have um, a, a, a large connection to to the fan base and, and what needs to come next. So um, our our growth of ticket sales um, will be focused on youth and community and families. It's not the same audience as RSL. Um, it's not. Uh, there are there are some cr there's some crossover of if you just like soccer, then you're gonna like watching either RSL or the Royals. Um, but we're also battling a little bit in that fan base that. 19 to 20,000 that um, RSL draws a little bit of just market fatigue. If you're a season ticket holder to RSL, you're already coming to 15 to 20 games a year. And then if you add the Royals on top of that, that's even, that's another 12 to 10, 12 to 15 games. So uh, your, your weeknights and weekends <laughs> from March through November are spent at Rio Tinto Stadium. So um, that's a big ask just from a, a, a human perspective so um, our focus is, is, is families um, and youth and um, you know uh, there's also it, it, the the market is smaller in Utah just because of the culture here of the state but women's football in the U.S. also has a large market base of just young independent on or um not necessarily entrepreneurs, but like workforce people. If you are in your mid to late twenties and you have a job and you have um, disposable income and you you live in a city that has um, a women's football team, a lot of those people are spending their money um, on tickets and concessions and games. So um, because the atmosphere is more approach approachable and accessible than an MLS team, so um, there are there they are different markets from RSL and MLS. Okay, fantastic. I just uh, it's on the last thing then to uh, wrap up the, uh, today's uh, discussion. Um, more sort of on a, on a personal note then for each of you, it's been quite an intense few months with everything that's been going on in the world outside of football, but in terms of how that's impacted on you in your roles, what have been the, the big main learnings you've taken from the past four or five months. Um, we'll start with Sandra and, and work our way across. Um, well, you know, I think what's really important, it's, it has been challenging for all of us, you know, it's, it's not just as a player or as a general manager, just as a person and for everybody, 
in this world and you know within their community it has been really tough um i personally for me um it was uh, also a moment where you could um also reflect upon some some issues um and, and i actually uh, learned a lot from it as well so it did give me something as well um but also you know it's it's everybody was saying because our league um was was ended uh, early um and whereas in other european um leagues they did um call a champion and we were up seven points um two games remaining before playoffs so you know i i think we deserve the title so um and at first i was really focused on that you know um, talking towards okay we need to win this title because we need to be rewarded for every work we put in and stuff like that but you know at one point i was like okay we're not going to get the title but what is even more so important is this past year that we've um, been doing so well it's not being taken away you know we've been enjoying day in day out to be able to be out on the field to be together doing the job that you know the players love most the, the staff loves most that i love most so you really appreciate every day that you're out on the field and that you're in this environment and um, doing something special and growing something special so um and i think in the end you know it it means more than a title and of course you want to win uh, and you want to win titles but it's i think even more important that you realize that what you're doing day in day out is is so nice and um um yeah i think that's that's in the end something that um and that, that yeah, it has been given to us and um, I'm really appreciative of, of and I think that's something that uh, um, yeah, is there for me, uh, has been there for me the past months and the, the less positive side of it, I think it's right now, it's, it's having to make so many plans with this COVID stuff, you know, that you're not certain if you're going to play uh, the uncertainty. I think it's very mentally challenging for everybody, you know, you have to and make a plan B, C, D, and E, and and still you're not sure if you're gonna play, and still we're not sure if we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna play the whole league, and um, I think that's that's a tough part of it. But um, if we uh, address this well enough with the, with the staff and with the players, that this is part of it, and be ready when you're asked to be ready. Um, yeah, I think uh, then fun things can happen. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah, some great great reflection there. Um, Anna, how uh, what have been those kind of key things that you've sort of learned about yourself and, and the role you're in over these past few months? Well, I think like what Sandra said, it's really the times of uncertainty. We don't really know, uh, you know, we come from a world where we know how it's been working and to a new world where we don't know how the season 2021 is going to look like. and you know, taking the team through this uncertain times without not knowing uh, when the games are going to start and if they're going to start. And really dealing with uh, players and staff's personal uncertainties and um, kind of like during that time, during the, during the spring, I decided that I need to show leadership and I need to be there to support everybody in their, like, um, yeah, feeling of uncertainty uh, and just to kind of address uh, the, the importance of uh, focusing on what we can focus, what we can do right now. You know, doing your best, like Sandra said, at every practice and developing yourself and, uh, and just kind of dealing with that. And, it's, you know, that's maybe that's how we should learn to live is carpe diem, you know, just um, taking one day at a time and what, what can I do today to be the best uh, what I can be, and uh, I don't, yeah, it's really, uh, it's really those things, and seeing, like, the human beings behind the players and the coaches, and trying to manage through them. Okay, thanks a lot for that, and finally, I'll leave the final word to, to Stephanie. Um, I think I've definitely learned um, during this year in this pandemic and this plan that uh humans are exhausting 
and dealing with people um, in a time where everyone's uncertain, everyone's nervous, um, with proper reason to be, um, that being the manager and the leader during that time is, is exhausting. Um, and um, I think it from a from a my duties perspective and and uh, i've definitely been reminded this year that the ability to be creative um and the ability to be flexible are are keys to success um because you can have the best laid plans um go down the toilet in just a moment's notice <laughs> so i think that that's been for me and being able to get through my day-to-day -day job those two pieces have been really key um, and then managing human emotions is definitely something that I have learned to do this year that I never thought I would have to be so skilled at. So um, those have been um, the, the key pieces to this year in my, in my learnings, I think. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, thank you one and all, Sandra, Anna and Stephanie for, for your time today and, and for sharing your, your experiences and knowledge. Thank you. It's been great. To learn yeah. from you all. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's been great. No, thanks a lot.